you to read some scripture in a moment with me, but I want to tell you about a prayer meeting one time that happened many, many, many years ago. About 120 folks had gathered in a room to pray and began to ask God to do some great things. As they were praying, they decided they'd take care of some church business, elect some folks to office and do some things of that sort. And they were uh, meeting as a church, uh, trying to get things ready, and a big event was fixing to come to town, and they knew thousands of people would gather all throughout that area and that it would be a great time for them to try to share the gospel, to begin to preach the gospel. Now one wonders, how big was this church that the attendance of the prayer meeting was given? 120 in the prayer meeting. You wonder uh, how many folks show up in this church on a prayer meeting time versus how many show up on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or something of that sort. So uh, one would say, well, there are 120 in that prayer meeting. I wonder how many uh, actually went to that church. Well, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that the Bible said when the Lord Jesus Christ raised from the dead, upwards of 500 people saw him. And so this church may have had more than 500 folks connected to it but they see this great event coming and on a Sunday the day of Pentecost would take place and these men could stand up in anywhere in the town and begin to preach and uh, folks could be saved because they had witnesses of the resurrection. But lo and behold, not only did they have witnesses of the resurrection, but the Holy Spirit of God showed up in such a powerful way, something so unusual, something that had never happened before, but something that was prophesied in the Old Testament took place, and they began to speak. And the Bible said, uh, tongues as cloven fire uh, went around that crowd. And the Bible tells us thousands, 3,000, as a matter of fact, got saved that day and were added after baptism to the local New Testament church. That church began to flourish and continued in such a way uh, that later we record five and 6,000 folks were in that church. Well, there's a man who all of a sudden uh, uh, started recognizing this great church and its numbers and its growth and things of that sort. And he decided, look, I'm going to destroy that church. He, he loved, uh, uh, he, he, he was so devoted to his Judaism that he was just as devoted to Judaism as he was to the destruction of the New Testament church. And he decided that he would put not only men, but women and children in prison simply for naming the name of Christ and simply for believing in the resurrection of the dead and simply for leaving Judaism. He would lock them up and punish them. Uh, boy, the events got so bad, they got so horrendous. They got so horrible, it wasn't just pastors, Brother Bobby, that were suffering. It wasn't just pastors, Brother Boyce, that were suffering. But they, taught, they brought the deacons before the persecuting crowd. They brought the deacons before the martyrdom uh, arena. And they began to uh, persecute them. And one such notable man in our Bible, by the name of Stephen, they were so angry. They were so worked up. They were so vile. They were so demanded. They were so uh, crazed, the Bible said. They gnashed on him with his teeth. They bit on him and then they picked up the largest rocks they could find, the biggest boulders they could lift as a human being and throw them down on this servant of God. As he began to perish, God in his graciousness, God in his kindness said, let me just pull back the curtains of heaven and let this servant of God look up. And as that servant of God looked up, he saw God seated there. He knew that seated at the right hand of God was the Lord Jesus Christ. You talk about getting dying grace. You talk about getting grace for all things. Grace for giving. Grace for suffering. Grace for dying. This man of God got it. He looked into the heavens and he saw the Son of God seated next to the Father stand up and begin to what looked like such a horror on this side. What looked so miserable on this side. What was so disappointing on this side. How our precious Bible calls it precious in the sight of God. And there was Christ Himself reaching out His hand saying, Come home, my servant. Amen. Stephen died there a martyr's death in heaven. Stephen might have said, what are we going to do about this, God? Maybe he said that. I don't know that he did or not. But maybe he said, what are we going to do about this, God? He said, sit down here. I want to show you something. This man's going to get on a Damascus road. And I'm going to show him something he'll never forget. I'll show him something to change his life. I'll show him something that makes him different than any other man that has ever walked the face of the earth for the New Testament church. And there he is on the Damascus road. We know the story well. He gets saved. And now this man, now he is so devoted to the spreading of the New Testament church as much as he is to the suspension of Judaism. And he begins to preach the gospel and share the gospel. Now he's an aged man as we come to the book of Romans. This aged man, had, uh, he had faced everything the young man had faced as a deacon. Uh, he had sought to put them in prison. He himself now has visited many prisons in many countries. He himself had thought to stone this man, consented unto the death, held the garments of that great man of God, Deacon Stephen. And now God says, I'll tell you what, you're going to be stoned. And Paul was stoned and left for dead, may have died, likely to die, went to the third heaven. 
and not allowed to come back and talk about it. Just tell us he went there. All of this going on. And now this aged man would stand and say to you, it was not eye for eye. It was not tooth for tooth. God did not do this to me because I did this to Stephen. Because I did it to men, women, and children. He would say, God did this because I have preached the gospel. And whenever you preach the gospel, you shall suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. And boy, he did. But he said it wasn't eye for eye, tooth for tooth. He said, matter of fact, I would gladly therefore suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he moves on to even say, not only would he gladly suffer, but he said, I want to tell you something. They thought to do me harm, but this has fallen out rather for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What a great man of God he was. As his ministry is closing, and he's under the prison guards of the Roman Empire, sure to be persecuted and finally put to death as a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ. He begins to write to his crowd. And may I say before I get there, you go with me to uh, Romans chapter 10 and 11. But before I get there, may I say to you what he said in the introduction of this great book of Romans. He said to that crowd, I have a debt that I want to pay. He said, I have this debt in Romans chapter number 1. But not only did he say, I have this debt in Romans chapter 1 to both Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. But he also said, I have a determination for as much as is in me. He said, as much as is in me. I have a determination. Then he goes on to say, I'm ready. That's a desire. He said to preach to you at Rome also. That's his duty. And finally, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one could say, what a devotion. How devout he was under the principles of God. But he comes to chapter 10. And I wonder if I had a title for the sermon, I guess I'd say it's the preacher's greatest burden. He says in chapter number 9 and chapter number 10, but we'll read three verses in chapter number 9 and then one in chapter 10. I say the truth in chapter 9, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were cursed from God for my brother and my kinsmen according to the flesh. And in chapter 10, brother, my heart's desire, verse 1, in prayer to God. For Israel is that they might be saved. Good Lord, man, did you just say that you wish you could be a curse? That you would like to die and go to hell so Israelites could be saved? My stars, I got saved not to go to hell. I got saved to get out of that place. Amen. And here is this man of God saying, I would die if God would. Now that's not his duty. It's not his right. It's not his honor. That's what Christ did for us. But I'm going to tell you, can you imagine, can you imagine being so, so oriented, so, so winning minded that you would say all of these homes in this community, God, if you'd let me go to hell and take every one of them to heaven, would you be willing to do that? And Paul said it is a continual sorrow. It is a desire. And it was his joy to win souls to Jesus Christ. Father, please, in this great Bible conference and in this great church. May I have the power of Almighty God on my life. I could not do this without you. I will not try to do it without you. If I did not believe I could be led of the Holy Ghost and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, I would not stand here. And I surrender to thy will and beg this day that you would have me. But also beg that you'd have the ears of these people and the hearts of these people. And that those two, the hearing and the heart, could meet up today to do something wonderful for God in this church service. How I pray for that and ask it in Jesus' name. And amen. Paul wrote to us, exclusively, I guess if you include Revelation 2 and 3, Paul is the exclusive writer of the New Testament church. Others made general epistles, others made uh, writings, the Gospels, the history book of the Bible, the book of Acts. But the exclusive writer of the New Testament church is the Apostle Paul, giving us much of our New Testament. If it were not for the Apostle Paul, we would not understand faith, promise, missions as we do. We wouldn't understand offerings as we do. But he gives us an idea of faith, promise, missions, helping us to reach this world for the lost, uh, that, for the, the, uh, uh, lost for the Lord Jesus Christ. May I say to you, a lot of folks, we hear a lot today about budgets. May I remind you that missions giving is not a budget, it's a burden. May I remind you of that? May I remind you of this principle also? The, we, this is something that is operated from faith. So if you can do it today, it's not faith. But if you're sitting there saying, man, I gave this last year, and the preacher wants more out of us this year. And if I give that, I can't do it. You have just entered the realm of faith. When you say, I cannot do it. Then you have entered the realm of faith. And that's where God wants us living. He doesn't want us to live in the status quo. He doesn't want us to live as where we've already been. He wants to take us where we haven't been. And may I remind you, God wants to show you. As it been said, and I'll say over and over in these services this week. God wants to show you that He's a God where you've not been. 
My, nobody likes the valley, but until you go through the valley, you'll never know you have a God of the valley. Until you get to the mountaintop, you'll never know you have a God on the mountain. Until you get to the mountaintop and experience that God is there for you. Remember, oh Moses, oh Moses came down the pike and said, God, I'm not able to bear the burden of these people. They're getting on my nerves. They're calling 24-7. Get rid of these cell phones, God. They're driving me nuts. He said, I'm not able to bear them. And God said, I am. <laughs> Don't you? Uh, now listen, y'all got to wake up and get with me here. Who is Jesus Christ? He's the I am. Yeah. Yeah. And boy, when you start reading that Old Testament, Moses said, I am not able. God said, I am. Yeah. They're out there hungry. They're ready to kill him. Nobody's had a, a crop grow yet. Nobody's got anything done. They're hungry. They're starving. And he says to God, I'm not able to feed this crowd. God said, I am. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like he went on to say, boy, these serpents have come through this camp biting people. They're going to die. I'm not able. I don't have an antidote. I'm not able. God said, I am. And you're going to find out there's a lot this church can't do because you say you can't do it. But if you'd let God show you what you can do. So get on your knees this afternoon and say, God, I'm not able. And listen to God say, I am. And let the I am take care of it. So when we look at this thing and we start thinking about missions, a lot of times folks say, well, i got to have a budget. I remind you it's a burden. It's not a matter of financial planning, but it's a matter of faith promise. A pastor carries the heaviness of the furtherance. God lays that load on him as he tries to further the gospel through soul winning and through witnessing and through sowing the seed and things of that sort. Going and grieving and giving, all that taking place. May I remind you, this is not something that is accomplished by a bake sale, yard sale, or some lottery funded program. It is a collection for the saints, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2. And Paul stated at Philippi, Macedonia, and Corinth to give to missions. And beloved, I must move you to participate in missions. Getting this, where would you be without the Word of God? Where would this country be without the Word of God? If you want to know the answer to that, get you a map out and look at all those lands that do not have the Word of God Flourishing in it like we do. And you will see desert places. You will see people under pagan practices. You will you'll see people controlled by cults. It is the Word of God that sets people free. And I beg you, let God do something mighty in your life. Not as easy as pen and paper. Charts will not do it. You don't get moved by a burden of your flesh. It is a spiritual man, as your preacher said this morning. The spiritual man. We'll have to see these things. If you sit there this morning and you have a conversation with yourself, you'll miss it. But if you have a conversation with your Savior, you'll see it. Yeah. Self will say, I cannot do it. The Savior will say, watch me do it. If we don't touch your heart, then you won't touch the lost. Right. I don't believe anyone here this morning. Please listen to what I'm saying. Now, maybe it's time. You've been listening to me for several minutes. It may be time for you to take that break and go into your doze. Now, I'm going to try to bring you back and listen to what I've got to say here. And say to you this morning, nobody in this room wants anyone to die and go to hell. Am I right? Nobody wants anyone to die and go to hell. Right. However, some will not do anything to stop people right. from dying and going to hell. Right. It's a different world today. We have borders, maybe not in this country, but they, they do everywhere else. And you don't get to go just anymore and plop on somebody. They want to know why you're there. And who approved you to be there? And it's an expensive world. And it was an expensive world in Paul's day because Paul's the one that sat up not only praying, but giving. So I want to share with you for a few moments this morning as I get into this message. And I want to tell you real quickly, number one, the problem in missions. Remember Paul said, I have a desire for Israel to be saved. What is the problem in missions? Our text in Romans shows us that missions needs a burden. If you don't have a broken heart for lost people, if you don't have a desire for lost people, why do you think God never set an amount? Everybody in this room understands the tithe, right? Everybody gets the tithe, right? That's, that means a tenth, and so that's an set amount, and it is a designated amount. It's to go to the local servants of the ministry. We'll get into that maybe later if we have time. And then we know about the offering. Everybody know, and, but there's no set amount on the offering. He just says, give an offering. And so this morning I would say, if you love heat, you ought to give some money to pay for the heat bill. Amen? That's the offering. Now, I don't want you to look at me like, what are you talking about? I'm simply saying, if you study this Bible out, every time you see the tithe, it is going to the priesthood. It is always going to the preacher. Melchizedek, the Levites, even read Hebrews 7. I hate to take a time out right here and preach it to you, but read Hebrews 7. It was a commandment given to the Levites to collect the tithe. But there's no more Levites. It now goes to the apostles. It goes to the local ministry. 
Then somebody will say, well, what about uh, the light bills? Well, we just threw a lot in there. Let the preacher pay for the light bills. We'll take it out of his tithe and pay for the light bill. Amen. That's what a lot. Of, uh, now, listen, I don't, mean, I don't mean to lose you. I'm just trying to get something set up here. But there's no amount on the, tithe, or the offering. What does the building need? That's the amount. Get together as a whole group and say, insurance costs this. Uh, heat costs this. This costs this. And let's make sure we're giving above the tithe. Because if you just give a tithe, you're not giving an offering. Tithe and offering means more than 10%. Glory to God, that's good preaching, preacher. How do you always get that in your sermons? <laughs> but when Paul instituted the missions giving, boy, he changed some things for us there. And when he instituted the missions giving, he placed a burden upon it. He, did, he said, I don't even want you to give it out of necessity, really. I want you to give it out of a cheerful heart. In other words, how much do you care? How delightful is it to you? How exciting is it to you to see people getting saved? That's how you give. We'll get into that maybe later. And I, I just don't want to lose you this early in the message. But if we participate, it becomes a burden. What do you think Brother Bobby gave you in Sunday school? He told you his heart's desire. He told you how much he wants to get Bibles into the hands of people who don't have Bibles. Some of these might could afford a Bible. Some of these might even have access to a Bible. But they don't realize they need it. And they would not buy it at their own expense because they don't know they need Christ. Right, right. And so we take it to them and say, you need this. You must have this. You've got to have this. And so Paul is churning and burning a continual sorrow. It is not seen sometimes in our prayers. And sometimes it's not seen in our personal soul winning. And sometimes it's not even seen in our promise giving. In other words, we talk about having a burden, but does it really burn? Is it something I've got to do? Is it something that I'm easily forgetting about? Or is it something I cannot get my mind off of? How much do I want to see lost people getting saved? Can you imagine this? Have you ever had heartburn? Did you feel that? Did you want to get rid of that burning? Well, think about one billion Muslims who reject Jesus Christ and will die and go to a devil's hell without Christ. And let that burn. And the only thing, Brother Bobby, that I find in my life that will ease the burning is when I give to missions. What about the billion Chinese floundering in false cults and communism? What about Judaism sending Jews to hell at a faster rate than in Paul's day? At least Jews were getting saved by the thousands in Paul's day. Could we say that today? Ah. A burden it will be the only way to change their eternal destination. I don't know about you, preacher. I assume in your church, and here's why I'm going to get on. I, I, they get mad at me at our church. I, I walked by one man one day and shook his hand. And he said, hey, I want to talk to you. All right. What are you talking about? What do you want to give me? How are you going to bless me? <laughs> and he goes, I want to talk to you. He said, that stuff preaching on you people that don't come back Sunday night and Wednesday night. That's got to stop. I'm tired of hearing about it. You know I don't come on Sunday night. You're preaching to me. You're saying that. And you know, and I'm going to let you right now. I ain't changing my mind. I'm not coming back on Sunday night and Wednesday night. And I'd say, brother, just you might find you like it. It's better than 60 minutes. We go about 63 <laughs> and I'd say, and they would get so upset. And so I don't know about you, but I think you'll see a lot of times in churches, this crowd Sunday morning, half back Sunday night. Maybe y'all do better. Maybe half of that crowd back Wednesday night. And I don't know about your church, but every church I've ever pastored, every church I've ever went to, not everybody gives to missions. Not everybody that gives ties gives to missions. So could you imagine maybe this morning that Let's say only a, only a quarter of the church, let's say a third of the church gives to missions. I mean, they write out and they put on that envelope, this is for worldwide missions. If only a third of them gave, let's say, let's just say a quarter gave. Our church supports about 40 missionaries. If a quarter of our people participate in missions and everybody started participating in missions, we'd have 160 missionaries. You know, the problem is there's no urgency. There's no concern for souls. There's no care. We'll just throw it in the general budget. You worry about it, preacher. Put that burden off on someone else. I heard the funny story. I thought it was a funny story about a mouse uh, that looked through a crack of the wall to see the farmer and his wife open a package. What food might this contain? The old mouse thought, thought what dinner am I going to have tonight? Well, he was so devastated to discover that it wasn't food in the package. It was a mouse trap. Retreating to the farmyard, the mouse proclaimed the warning. There's a mouse trap in the house. There's a mouse trap in the house. The chicken clucked and scratched, raised her head and said, Mr. Mouse, 
I can tell you this is a grave concern to you, but it is of no consequence to me. I cannot be bothered by it. The mouse turned to the pig and told him, There's a mouse trap in the house. There's a mouse trap in the house. For God's sake, there's a mouse trap in the house. The pig sympathized but said, I'm very sorry, Mr. Mouse. There's nothing I can do about it but pray. Be assured you're in my prayers. The mouse turned to the cow and said, There's a mouse trap in the house. There's a mouse trap in the house. And the old cow said, Wow, Mr. Mouse, I'm sorry for you, but it's no skin off my nose. So the mouse returned to the house, head down, dejected, to face the farmer's mouse trap alone. That very night, sound was heard throughout the house like the sound of a mouse <laughs> a trap catching its prey. The farmer's wife rushed to see what she had caught. And in the darkness, she did not see the venomous snake and its tail had been caught in the track or in the, in the mouse trap. The snake was furious and bit the farmer's wife. The farmer rushed her to the hospital and she returned home with severe fever. Everyone knows that you treat a fever with fresh chicken soup. <laughs> so the farmer took the hatchet to the barnyard for the soup's main ingredient. But his wife's sickness continued. So friends and relatives came to sit with her around the clock. To feed him, the old farmer butchered the pig. The farmer's wife didn't get any better, and soon she died. So many people came to the funeral, and the farmer had the cow slaughtered to provide enough meat for all of them. The mouse looked upon it all from his crack in the wall with great sadness and said, I warned them about the mouse trap, but they didn't take the warning into account. And how many times have we stood before people and told them about a dying world going to hell? And a lot of people said, no skin off my nose. Nothing for me to worry about. See, I'm talking to you about Paul speaking to us about the problem in missions. No urgency. Can I give you a second thought rather quickly, and I'm trying to hurry. But uh, how about the purpose of missions? We know it's to evangelize the world. The early church. Can I say this to you? The early church is the roots of our church. Do you understand what I'm saying there? Every church that is... You know how all of you came from Adam and Eve? All of us came from the Jerusalem New Testament church. That's where we came from. And so it is our roots. Faith promised missions that sent Barnabas and Paul to reach us. The commission was one of concern. It was one of debt. It was one of compassion, Jude said. Paul called it a debt. He called it an obligation. It is twofold. We are... You have, from the very beginning, God sent his son. So God is the sender. Jesus is the sent one. And then that move has been transferred to the New Testament church where we read in Acts chapter 13 where the apostle Paul and, and Barnabas and others are being called, separate unto me, Barnabas and Saul, and send them out for the work where I have called them. And now all of a sudden God says, here's, I'm going to show you this work that went on between me and Christ. I'm the sender. He's the sent one. Now here comes the responsibility and what God says is, look, Every now and then I'm going to look out at this church and see somebody that ought to serve me. Somebody that's fit. Somebody that can get the job done. And some, some church somewhere in this country, God plucked up a voice and brought him here because you needed him. And what that church does sometimes is it takes on missionaries. And God did this. God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to bring those men down here. I want you to put them at the altar. And I want you to lay hands on them. And that is signifying that now they are the sent ones. And you're the senders. And you will promise this church. And you will promise that missionary that we will stay here. And we will stay faithful. And we will give to keep you on the mission field. And we will give so you can come back and give your report. We are the senders. We're vested in this work. We have laid our hands to it. Is what he's saying. That's the program of missions. This is what God wants you and I doing. This is the expectation of God upon our lives. Boy, aren't you glad this morning that you're just the sender, not the sent one? Maybe you're not on the field where persecution is. As Brother Bobby talked in Sunday school about all those that died. Aren't you glad when we asked you to witness that you were to purchase a Bible and give a Bible to somebody? If you gave $2.50... To, some, to this ministry so they could put a Bible in somebody's hand that it would not cost you your life. But the Bible you have that you're reading from way back in years gone by, those men were burned at the stake 
for trying to give the common man the common reading of the Word of God. But that's the responsibility. I'm so glad that as the sender, I don't have to go through what our missionaries go through. But you know, God didn't tell us to go do that. He leaves some here to send. And then I abruptly close the message with the program of missions. We find it so much in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. I don't have time to go through it all. But it's a matter of opportunity and obedience. This passage shows us in, and you're familiar with it. I will not insult your intelligence. Act like you don't know what's in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. You've heard the great words. Uh, if you sow, you shall reap. And you, you hear all those things. And in that passage of Scripture, he talks about sowing and reaping. Then he talks about, uh, he talks about sufficiency and rejoicing. Then he talks about subjection to this thing and the rewards. And you get this idea, you sow, you will reap. You get this idea that if you, uh, you give sufficiency, there will be rejoicing on the mission field instead of some missionary coming home brokenhearted saying, I can't stay, the funds have run out. And then you'd have the same thing with subjection. If you subject to this, you will see rewards. Now, when I say this to you, I say that when you involve yourself in missions, giving, sowing and reaping, you're being spiritual to a degree. Now, what do you mean by that? Because when you give to missions, to the amount you give is to the amount that you will reap. And so if you were to go out today and plant you a corn crop, how many of you might could plant a really, really sizable uh, uh, corn crop with a five pound bag of corn? Do you realize most of you, when you go down to the feed store to do your little garden, there's a half a pound or a pound of seed in there. Now, how many of you, when you pluck your corn at the end of the season, expect only to get a half a pound of corn back? Get a whole lot. Do you see what he said? When you send out a container of Bibles, thousands get saved. You might send out a whole lot less Bibles, but you get a whole lot more saved because that's God's method of sowing and reaping. He always multiplies it. He always makes it bigger than it ought to be. Then he talked about sufficiency and rejoicing. It's a matter of multiplication, 2 Corinthians 9, 8. He said, all grace is able to abound towards you. And so what God is saying is, and I'm hurrying through this, but he's talking about this grace when God promised all sufficiency in all things. He goes on to say in 10, verse 10, he will multiply the seed. You see, in other words, if you and I will do a liberal distribution of the seeds, if we will send out the word of God, the missionary will get it. He will take it to the foreign field and God will multiply the seed, which causes you to be righteous because you gave. It turned into a Bible, which turned into a man's hand that got that man saved. And God is saying right there, that's righteousness. That's right living. And then God sends it to you through them. What God does is said, well, you've given that. Now I'm going to give back to you. I'm going to give back to you. That's what God says. Preacher, I have a few more minutes. Well, I should ask the congregation. The congregation goes like this. I want to tell you just a couple stories and I'll be done. True life stories, but one personal, real quick. I don't know, but how many of y'all get frustrated with the rising prices on everything? So back in the dark ages, I pull up to a gas station and you got to understand, for guys used to going into the store and buying a 79 cent Coke or a 59 cent Coke and a bag of Doritos, maybe nacho cheese Doritos, and do that every day of the week. And then all of a sudden, them things got up to 79 cents and 99 cents. And now I'm, I even see them, I don't buy them anymore. Going to the store, they're $1.79. Put tax on it, it's almost $2 for a little buy. You can buy a whole two liter uncold, not cold. For a dollar, but they, boy, they just, and finally I stand there one day trying to figure out how I can get more money for missions in our church. We had so much debt on that little church. How can I get, so finally it's like God spoke to me and said, hey, you don't have to buy them Cokes. Yeah. So I said, all right, Lord, I'll give up Cokes and nacho cheese Doritos and I'll give up my candy bars. And I'm going to see how, now I buy a Coke every day and I buy a bag of nacho cheese Doritos, the big bag every week. I buy a two liter Coke for at the house and a Coke for driving around in the vehicle. I'm going to total that up and I'm going to start giving that to you. And I'll just quit buying them things. Now I know you can't tell, but I said I'm going to quit buying them things. Now let me tell you why you can't tell. Because lo and behold, it wasn't too long I was sharing with people and I said, well, man, just give up your Cokes. Give up your can't, give up the unnecessary things for just one month. Just quit buying the things you really don't need that aren't helping you. And I told how I gave up Cokes, candy bars, and nacho cheese Doritos. And then, 
I come home one night and on the back porch is an eight pack of Cokes and nacho cheese Doritos <laughs> and candy bars. Somebody didn't want me to give them up. Somebody was afraid the word of God would fail. I'd look skinny. Like God wasn't blessing. So God has promised I'd never go hungry and he's seen to it. And so I would go tell the stories. Just like I'm telling you. Not to get a candy bar or anything. Just tell the stories that we can give up something because getting people saved is more important. And so I would say to somebody, boy, my favorite candy bar. I wasn't saying it to get a candy bar. I just saying, man, I love them Malacups. cups. Love them. Boy, that... That, that marshmallow cream drip on your chin after you bite, and ain't no way it's going to get on there. You, you just can't get it long enough time. You go, oh, good, 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 good stuff. Hallelujah. And then I'd say, my favorite chocolate is dark chocolate. Milk chocolate, I suffer through, but dark chocolate, I don't share it. I, if I had some milk chocolate, you might get a piece of that, but I have my dark chocolate under lock and key. It does not leave. And so uh, I'd tell them, and so... One year, my daughter's got me. I said, well, I need a tackle box just for my light fishing. You know, I just want to go fishing for, uh, 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 for the uh, uh, pan fish. And I just want a little tackle box just for that. And I'm just going for pan fish, not the other stuff. And so my girls got me a tackle box for Christmas one year. But they also got me all my candy bar favorites. Boy, them almond, uh, them almond Snickers. and I am advertising now. Peanut butter Snickers and all that stuff. And they just filled that thing up. And it took me to my birthday in July to get it all at. So this past year, they bought me more. And then the church started buying. Just because I told the story, I gave, they, just, they thought it was cute. They're going to take care of the preacher and all that stuff. I had to say at Christmas, you cannot buy no candy this year. I'm not done with last July's candy yet. I, Brother Bobby, I didn't even put tackle in that tackle box. I started getting them. They bring me them bite-sized ones, you know. And I filled up my tackle box, tray after tray, with candy bars. If you didn't make it to the tackle box, you had to go in the refrigerator or something. I mean, just too much candy. Loaded me up. Now the, 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 the old people just like the new ones, they'll go to crack. The only place you can find, I'm advertising, the only place you can find dark chocolate Malacups cups is at Cracker Barrel. Well, they heard preacher likes Malacups, cups, dark chocolate. Guy comes in, 10 Malacups. cups. Another lady comes in, bought me a case of them. Case of them. Now the little kids come up, little, and the parents send them up with my Malacups, cups and I brag on them behind the pulpit. I don't want to stop that supply. <laughs> Malacups cups get eat first. And Brother Bobby, you know what hit me one day? You big dummy. Why didn't you give God your car? <laughs> Why didn't you give up something else, dummy? <laughs> to this day, I've never bought a computer. But I've bought several missionaries' computers. And never failed somebody in church to say, Well, preacher, you, you have a computer? Nope. Why don't you have one? They'd buy me a computer. And I learned the principle, you can't outgive God. Yeah. I didn't give up those things to get. I gave up those things to give. Man. And God has not let me go without. Just last Wednesday night, little girl, four-year-old girl, hit preacher and brought me a little Cracker Barrel bag. And I got two Cracker Barrel uh, Malacups cups sitting in the hotel. Brought them with me because I can't leave them at the house. <laughs> Hey, my, I left the Snickers at home, but I ain't getting my Malacup cup stolen. <laughs> can't, you, can't you this morning almost say, there's something I could give up. I wouldn't miss it. God may resupply it or give me something even better than that. If I just try to get a few more Bibles out there. I read this story, and I, this is a story I close with. Sorry I went a couple minutes over, three, four, five. But I read the story of the Empress of Ireland. It was a tragedy of the high seas. On board were 130 Salvation Army officers, as well as many, many other passengers. Only 21 Salvation Army officers survived. The other 109 died. They said of all those that died, none of them had a life jacket. The survivors of that shipwreck said that those Salvation Army officers were taking off their life jackets and giving them to lost people. They would go up to people in the ocean and say, I know Jesus and I can die better than you can. I want to say to you today, church, I know Jesus and I can live without a few dollars better than a lost person can. 
I'm saved. I can give to save a soul. Jesus will supply it. He will give it. Why don't we just maybe today say, you know, preacher, I'm saved. I can die better than lost people. And so I'd like to start giving maybe a little bit more to these Bibles, to getting people saved. I can live better than a lost person. I can give up a Coke. I can give up a candy bar. Give up a bag of chips. Give up going out, whatever. Because I know Jesus. And I know a lost person can't die as good as I can die. And I just decided I was willing, after reading that story, to maybe give up some things. So that I could get missionaries on the foreign field. Because I can die better than them and I can live without a life jacket. Amen. I can live without these things. Would you stand with me this morning?